Blessings, their sleep's a blessing, no doubt. How cruel of you to keep us up so late last night and have poor Mother beside herself with worry and fear. How cruel of you, Dolly. Oh, Dolly, how cruel of you to be in bed when I came home last night and not here to greet me. <laughs> to breakfast, bed, Cap. need to make any more of that confounded clatter. Breakfast is ready. I shall attend you immediately, sir. Was that out of the Prince's Delight, or the Prince's Garland, or the Prince's Guide to the Gallows, or some such improving textbook? I know of no such work, sir. No need to beautify yourself on my account. No, sir. Dreams. Let sculptors have such visions. All true, my dear. True as the gospel, Dolly. And Barnaby beside him, less sensible than ever from surprise and fright. It's as well as happened as it did, or the poor young gentleman might have met his death in a very short time. Oh, oh Mr. Edward, I dread to think of it. How did you know him, Father? Know him? Never having seen the young gentleman before, how could I? Now, pass Toby Jug Esquire this way, my dear. Nothing like a little sparkling home-brewed ale for breakfast. Teas for salts. Well, do go on, Father, please. Mr. Edward. Well, I took him at once to Mrs. Rudge, and she told him, told me it was young Mr. Chester. Miss Emma's Mr. Chester, I've heard you speak of. But poor Miss Emma. If she hears too suddenly. As yes, for that, she knows already. You're sure of that? I've every reason to be. But how, Father? Father, how does Miss Emma know? What's the matter with the lad? Is he choking? Oh, sir. Who? Why you? What do you mean by making those horrible faces over breakfast? <laughs> faces are a matter of taste, sir. Save me, you're a fool. I'd rather see your right senses. These young fellows are always committing some folly or other. There's young Joe Willett. He'll be missing one of these mornings. Gone on some wild goose errand, seeking his fortune. What's the matter, Dolly? You're making faces now. Girls are as bad as the boys, every bit. It, it, it's the tea. It, it's so very hot. Then all, we'll put some more milk in it. Yes, I'm sorry for young Joe. He's a lucky young fellow and gains on one every time one sees him. But he'll be off one of these days, you'll find. Indeed, he told me as much himself. Indeed. Indeed. What's the matter, child? Is that tea still tickling your throat? Oh, no, Father, no. I declare the girls are as bad as the boys, every bit. Uh, Father, do go on with what you were saying. Hmm. Well, how was that? W Miss Emma. How come she knows about poor Mr. Edward? How come she knows? Because I directed she should. But how, Father, how? Barnaby Child, Barnaby Rudge, who else? It's all right, Miss Emma. Master's in his study. He won't move out for an hour or more. Oh, thank you, Betsy. I brought Barnaby through the kitchens and up the back staircase. Let me see him. Barnaby, good Barnaby, what news? Steel, steel. What do you say, Barnaby? Steel, steel. Does he mean he's fought a duel? Oh, not Barnaby, miss, to be sure. Mr. Edward. Has Mr. Edward fought a duel? Oh, yesterday he went a wooing. I could not meet him, good Barnaby. My guardian bid me go to a masquerade with him. Steel. Steel, blood, blood. Is he hurt? Mm -hmm. oh. Miss Emma, is it bad? He came to the woods yesterday as arranged. But his horse going lame, he had to walk back to London. To walk? On the way back, he was set upon and robbed. Oh, Miss Emma, oh, he's been hurt, Betsy. I must write to him. How like father himself to take such trouble for poor Miss Emma. Well, the trouble will have been Barnaby. 
It comes and goes like the wind. A little more of the round of beef, Dolly. Well, looky, a man suffers for being good-natured. And when your blockhead father should have been in bed, he did take upon himself still more trouble for Mr. Edward. What else, father? I thought when I was taking him to the widow Rudd's that I was delivering him into honest hands. But of course, father. I always thought her an honest woman. Poor soul. She deserved a better fate than to be left with her only child, half-witted, after her husband had been foully murdered. You speak in riddles, father. Mr. Haredale's been most generous. He's given a pension all these years and the house she lives in. Although he could hardly do less. Poor Rudge being murdered in the service of the family. What are you trying to say, Father? Misfortune's been hers, Dolly, but she's been generously treated by her friends. She has no necessity or poverty. And yet I fear she's in some wickedness. Wickedness it is of you to say so. I've known Mary Rudge a good many years, and I would have thought so too. And yet... But what, Father? My lips are sealed, child, but... Last night, I feared for the safety of your Mr. Chester. Father! Well, what could I do? He cannot be moved. So what could I do but go last night to his father? On him now rests the safety of his son. The missus is bad, sir. She can't come down. Dear, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Such a time of misery she had last night, thinking she'd seen the last of you. Thinking of you as having been set upon and robbed and murdered. She looks as if she's going to burst into tears. And I'm to tell you that Mrs. don't feel equal to nothing after what she suffered. She don't feel equal to nothing. Except some strong mixed tea in the little black teapot. A couple of rounds of buttered toast and a middling sized dish of beef and ham. Cut thin. Oh, and the Protestant manual. Both volumes. He seems tolerably well. The surroundings are not quite what my son and a gentleman should lie in. But as he cannot be moved for another day, he must suffer them. Yes, sir. I do not, however, fully appreciate the circumstances in which my son came to be brought here last night. Mr. Varden, sir. Mr. Gabriel Varden, the locksmith. That was not my inquiry, ma'am. That much intelligence I have. My inquiry related to the circumstances in which my son came to be on that part of the road on foot so late at night. I do not know, sir. My son has not informed you. No, sir. A mystery, is it not? A oh, mystery indeed, sir. A letter? She gave me a letter. I told her all about it, about the steel and the blood, and she gave me this. Indeed, sir. No. For whom is your letter? Take no notice of him, sir. He's as a child. He's fanciful, sir. Not so fanciful as not to be able to be a messenger for my son and um, some lady, perhaps? Oh, I do not know, sir. Intriguing, is it not? Who is this lady my son corresponds with? But I need not concern myself. Ned is a dutiful boy. I am most blessed, ma'am, with a dutiful son. If Ned has given his heart to a lady, I shall have no fears. A lady of rank and fortune, no doubt. Oh, no finer lady ever breathed, sir. You know her then, ma'am? Uh, yes, sir. And her name, ma'am? Miss Emma Haredale. I am disappointed. I took you to be an honest woman. Sir? No honest person can have any dealings with a Catholic. Your son may deliver his letter, but not a word, ma'am, of the intelligence I have just received from you about my son's attachment to this unfortunate young lady. Something will come of this. Something will come of this. I hope it make me human gore. What an you are, Which some shall find out sooner than they think for. Oh, Meg's, I'm a telling you, if the Prentice is ever a master spirit at their head, I won't say I don't know a band of reckless daredevils. Oh, Simon! And I won't say I don't know someone very near at hand who's ready to become their leader. Oh, Simon! And I won't say but a day will come when these Prentices shall rise to claim their ancient rights. And when that day comes, 
The Lord Mayor himself will shiver and tremble in his guild hall. So he will. Oh, Spimily, give me such a fluttering and a tremor. <laughs> and when that day comes, Migs, these prentices will throw off the serfdom that the masters keep upon us. Oh, Simon! I eyed her all over. Which was, of course, the reason of her being confused. Oh, that Miss Dolly. And Migs! I'll eye you all over, oh, too. Oh, Simon! The eye has power to subdue the haughtiest of beauties, if you know how to use Ooh. it. Oh, yes! And to eave down dumb animals, even in a fierce and rabid state. Oh, Simon! Father? Two supplying, one key. Sixpence. To repair of one lock. Eightpence. Well, child, how's your lady mother? She's a little stronger, father, and will be down directly. Well, it's a fortunate thing that tomorrow's quarter day and the accounts have to be delivered today. <laughs> will you be calling to inquire about Mr. Chester? I will, child, when the day's work is done. Oh, father, you will not be away from home this evening as well. Child, your father has much to do to keep you supplied with your pretty bonnets and ribbons. And your good mother with her migs. Oh, migs. When you marry, child, never have a migs about you. Father, cannot you find some time to call this afternoon? Well, what will mother say if you're away from home this evening, too? <laughs> Between me and you, child, I think the Protestant manual will be in fine feather tonight. Your mother's never so devout as when she's at variance with me. Yes, Father. And between me and you, child, the Widow Rodge has other visitors after sunset, and if they should call again, I should like the pleasure of their acquaintance. Simon! Who's there? Mercy be. No! <laughs> Dreaming too. He's there. He's there. God save you, neighbor. Oh, and you, friend. Oh, your kind heart has brought you here again. Nothing will keep you at home, I know, of old, if there are friends to comfort. Tut, tut, you women are such talkers. <laughs> what of the patient? He's very restless towards daylight. He mustn't be removed until tomorrow, but the doctor says he'll soon mend. He's had no visitors. Old Mr. Chester called at your bidding. Quite so. No ladies? Oh, there was a letter. Who was the bearer? Barnaby, of course. <laughs> Barnaby. He's a jewel. Comes and goes with ease where we who think ourselves much wiser would be very hard put to it. Oh, but neighbour, if I could but tame that terrible restlessness. In good time, in good time. I would, it could be so. Good Mary, I'm sorely troubled in my mind and I speak to you as an old acquaintance. Has that ill-looking fellow been here again? I swear not. What have you to do with such a rough... Oh, ask me no more questions, I beg of you. I can only say this. Troubles do not come singly. Other troubles, friend? Ask me no more. Whom else could you speak to but your old friend? And your old sweetheart in the bargain? He's changed shadows with a woman. Her shadow's always with him, and he's with hers. <laughs> That's sport, I think. <laughs> uh, upstairs. He, he wants you. Oh. I've been dreaming too. High church is falling down. Strange creatures crowded up together, neck and heels. And fire, and fire. Dreams, Barnaby, dreams. Dreams, those are not dreams. What are dreams if they are not? Oh, I dreamed, I dreamed just now, that something, it was, it was in the shape of a man. It, it followed me. It wouldn't let me be, but came softly. 
exactly after me. I was always hiding and crouching like a cat in dark corners, waiting till I should pass when it crept out and came softly after me. You ever see me run? <laughs> you never saw me run as I run in this dream. Still it came creeping on to worry me. Nearer, 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 nearer. I ran, faster, leapt, sprang out of bed, and to the window, and there, in the street outside, he's waiting for us. Who is in the street outside waiting? Upstairs. He wants you. Oh, thou who has taught me such deep love for my unhappy son. Help him in his darkened walk through this sad world. Help him, or he is doomed. He comes. He comes. Mr. Chester, sir, how do you find yourself now? It's thanks to you, my good friend, that I find myself here at all. But for your timely aid, I... No, say no more, say no more. I hope I would have done at least as much for any man in such straits. Most of all for you, sir. My wife and daughter have much affection for a very beautiful young lady. She... Uh, she has spoken of you, sir. When her good lady mother died, my wife became her foster mother and my daughter, her childhood companion. Won't you be seated, Mr. Varden? May I meet make so bold as to lean on your chair and stand here for the convenience of speaking low. You've had no visitors here today. My father called. No one else? None that I hear of. Pray tell me, sir, what exactly happened last night? I had my reasons for inquiring. You left the maple alone. And walked homeward alone until I reached the place where you found me when I heard the gallop of a horse. Behind you? Indeed, yes, behind me. It was a single rider who soon overtook me and, checking his horse, inquired the way to London. You were on the alert, sir, surely, knowing of the highwaymen who scour these roads. Why, yes, but I had only my stick, having imprudently left my pistols at the maypole. Well, I directed him as he desired, but before the words had passed my lips, he rode upon me furiously, as if bent on trampling me down beneath his horse's hoofs. In starting aside, I slipped and fell. <laughs> you found me with this stag, an ugly bruise or two, and without my purse, in which he found little enough for his pains. And now, Mr. Varden, saving the extent of my gratitude to you, you know as much as I do. Except... Except in respect of the robber himself, sir. What was he like, sir? The night was so dark, and the attack so sudden, and he so wrapped and muffled up. It was more what I heard, though. Yes, go on, sir. Well, then... There was a stranger at the Maypole. His voice had a peculiarly harsh and unpleasant tone. If he and the robber were two different persons, all I can say is that their voices were remarkably alike. As I feared, and here last night, the very man. What dark history is this? You were saying, Mr. Varden? Uh, nothing, sir, nothing. What's the matter? Keep up your spirits. Never say die. I'm a devil. I'm a devil. Strange companion, sir. Strange indeed, sir. The bird has all the wit. Is the bird old? Hmm. A mere boy, 160 or thereabouts. If there's any wickedness going, that raven's in it, I'll be bound. What was that, Mr. Varden? Nothing, sir, nothing. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that, be known of God, is manifest in them. Me, girl, me. Oh, sir, we were just getting on our nightcaps to sit up, me and mistress. Oh, she's been so bad. Master's come home, Mim. You was wrong, Mim, and I was right. I thought he wouldn't keep us up so late, two nights running. Master's always considerate. So far, I'm so glad, Mim, on your account. I'm a little sleepy myself. I'll own it now, though I said I wasn't when you asked me. Ain't of no consequence, Mim, of course. 
You'd better go to bed at once, then. Thanking you kindly, sir. I couldn't take a rest in peace or fix my thoughts upon my prayers, otherwise than that our new mistress was comfortable in her bed this night. By right, she ought to have been there hours ago. You're talking to the mistress. Taking the hint, sir, and thanking you more, most kindly for it. I will make bold to say that if I give offence by having consideration for my mistress, I do not ask your pardon, but am content to get myself into trouble and to be in suffering. Hold your tongue. Yes, me, my will. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. How do you find yourself now, my dear? Full of envy, murder, debate, <laughs> deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boastful, inventors of evil things. I was making an inquiry of you, my dear. You're very anxious to know, aren't you? You who've not been near me all day wouldn't have been if I were dying. <laughs> Martha, my dear Martha, how could you say such things if you were dying? Why, if there's anything seriously wrong with you, wouldn't I be in constant attendance on you? No doubt you would, Martha. Yes, certainly. You'd be hovering round me like a vulture, waiting till the breath was out of my body so that you'd go and marry somebody else. Oh, Mim, I'm sure the master had no such thought. Hold your tongue. My one desire is to see Dolly comfortably settled in life, and when she is, you may settle me as soon as you like. You'll break my heart one of these days, and then we shall both be happy. Uh, my dear Martha, what you complain of? I really came home tonight with every wish and desire to be happy. I did indeed. What do I complain of? Well, is it not a very chilling thing to have one's husband directly comes home to have him freezing all one's warm-heartedness and throwing cold water all over the fire? I'm very sorry, Martha, but I really did. No, Varden, no. I'm not a child to be corrected one moment to be petted the next. I'm a little too old for that. Migs, carry the light. You can be cheerful at least. Now, who would ever believe that woman could be pleasant and agreeable? And yet she can be. Oh, well. All of us have our faults. I'll not be hard upon her. We've been man and wife too long for that. Miggs. I wish somebody would marry Miggs. <laughs> but that's impossible. I wonder if there's a madman alive who'd marry Miggs. <sighs> The devil be this he got to stop up so late. What's that? What's that? Here's mysteries. Gracious, here's mysteries.
a walking funeral and never be very decent with a mourning coach and feathers if the boy has been made a key for his own self. Oh, the little villain. There. Now let's see whether you won't be glad to take some notice of me, Master Simmon. to somebody else now besides Miss Dolly, I think. That face push she is as ever I come across. I don't go to bed this night. I don't go to bed this night till you come home, my lad. I wouldn't. Not for five and forty pounds. <laughs> 